In 2 Kings chapter 4, we see Elisha going to Gilgal and there's famine in the land. And he decides, Nathan, he wants to send uh, off his servant, me, to go and get food to make a stew to feed the hungry people. So what he does, the servant goes off, gets some food, because there's famine, he finds there's a, an, a wild vine, and he gets the gourds and he collects them all up and he brings and puts them in the stew. And then as the people are eating the stew, one of them's like, oh, oh, there's death in the pot. And so they call out to Elisha and Elisha comes, he says, put a little bit of flour in. They put the flour in, they eat it and nobody is harmed. It's a funny little story, isn't it? But shall we show them what it looks like? So you're going to be Elisha, I'm going to be the servant. All right, you ready? Go off and get the stuff for the stew. Okay, so I'll go and get, get some. I found a few carrots, stick them in our stew there. And then look, I found this wild vine. I think I'm going to put the gourds of this in the pot. Do you think that's a good idea? No. No, why not? Do you think it might be poisonous? Yes. I think it would be all right. Let's just shove them in anyway. So we shove them in, we cook our pot, off we go, and then the time comes to serve. Should we give you a little bit of spoonful? Here we go. Here's a spoonful. Now, when I give this to you, you're going to pretend that there's death. You're going to, you know, like pretend that you're dying. Ready? Here we go. Spoonful of the stew. What's wrong, Nathan? There's death in the pot! There's death in the pot! Have you ever done that? Isn't the Bible just amazing? You just recognise things in it. You just go off and be like, oh, don't worry about these gourds from the wild vine. Let's stick them in the pot. It will be all right. And then moments later, you're like, oh my goodness, I've made a terrible mistake. I remember when I was dating Leslie, one time went out with her family and her dad drove. And he, I said, park in this car park. It's going to be a perfect place to park for this this dinner and he's like oh do you think I need a ticket I said don't worry about it you won't need a ticket it's after five o'clock anyway after the dinner lovely dinner we came back there he was parking ticket on his car I was like oh what a mistake when we make a mistake so often what happens is that we we go to internalize what we've done we start to feel shame we start to feel shame but the bible shows us this passage shows us my experience is that with God there's hope for us who feel shame. Let's see what happens in the rest of this passage. Elisha, there's death in the pot, what should we do? Put some flour in it. Come on then, get a bit of flour, stick it in. Oh, use your fingers, otherwise we'll have a whole pot of flour in. There we go. Oh wow, there's a lot in there, isn't there? And then let's, <laughs> let's have a little taste of this. A bit of that, oh lovely. Oh, delicious food. So the key question we're looking at today is what, what do we do when we make a mistake? When we do something wrong, when we've made a mistake, what do we do? So often what happens is we internalize. How could you be so stupid? When we internalise a mistake, it means we go over and over it after. It's like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And it leads so often to shame, to shame. We make a mistake, we internalise it, and then we feel shame. What's wrong with you? Now, when we feel ashamed, when we feel shame, that often can then manifest itself. Either we retreat, we don't want to talk about that particular area of life. We maybe just retreat generally from relationships. Or another thing is we can go in anger. You ever seen one of those, somebody who, when they're just ashamed, they just lash out? Maybe you are, I've sometimes, I do that. You know, anger and retreat are the, out, the byword of shame. And that all comes from when we internalize a mistake. But the great hope, the hope, for those who feel shame is actually there's another way you can go from a mistake instead of internalizing we cry out we cry out the prophets are like oh man of god there's death in the pot we cry out these are the gods i've put them in i've made a mistake and when we cry out it doesn't lead to shame it leads to gain 
it leads to gain. Not shame, but gain. When we cry out after a mistake, it leads to gain. Isn't that amazing? In goodness of God, when we cry out to him, we say, God, I've made a mistake. He so often brings it to our gain. Our gain is twofold. We gain that we have forgiveness. If we've done wrong, if it's our sin, we're forgiven. God forgives. He throws the flower in the pot to forgive, to cover over what we've done wrong. And then secondly, gives goodness. Goodness. So let me talk to you. If you're somebody you recognise that, mistakes you've made become internalized it makes you question things about yourself you you find that you end up in shame feeling angry maybe at yourself or others feeling like you retreat you you just need to hide that part of your life i'll tell you about debbie a friend of mine debbie was driving her car one day to church she got some traffic lights and at the traffic light she was going to turn across the traffic but a car she didn't see a car coming the other way so she turned across the car hit her car her mistake big mistake caused an accident the biggest tragedy of it was that in the back of her car debbie was giving a lift to a friend's daughter to take her friend's daughter to church as the car hit her car it hit directly where this little girl was sitting and the girl was killed it is awful terrible story of a mistake made that leads to the most tragic of consequences. What did Debbie do with that mistake? Well, to start with, she went into shame. She went into retreating and anger. She was so angry with herself, she retreated. She shut herself in a room, she says, for two or three months, turned the lights off, wouldn't really eat properly, wouldn't see anybody, just total depression, wouldn't, uh, and anorexia issues, all kinds of stuff. And then she got to a point where she thought, you know, can I go on living? Maybe I, maybe I just can't go on living. Maybe I'm just gonna end it. And at that moment, she was a Christian. She was on her way to church, remember, when that, when that crash happened. The church had been praying for her. And in that moment where she had that deepest, darkest thought, she just suddenly thought, I just need to cry out to God. And she, she cried out to God. Nothing changed instantly. But slowly, as she began to cry out, she began to be able to tell God exactly what it was that she'd done. She began to say, I put death in this pot. I've put death in this pot. And over the course of a few weeks, she began to just confess, this is what I've done. And to receive the forgiveness of God. Not just to tell him what she'd done, to receive the forgiveness of God. It's like when the flower is thrown in the pot, You come to Jesus, you recognize he's here, you invite him into your moment, into your heart, and you say, Jesus, I need you to put your forgiveness on this. And he did it for Debbie. She began to feel that although she'd regret for the rest of her life what she'd done, she'd know she was forgiven, that the shame had been taken away. And instead, she found that God wanted to bring goodness to her. She would be able to be somebody who could bring comfort and support to others who'd gone through horrendous situations. Now that Debbie is Debbie Wright, who leads Nottingham Trent Vineyard, and now actually oversees the whole of the Vineyard Church movement. And she has seen thousands upon thousands of people carrying shame through mistakes set free from their shame. So if you're carrying shame right now, I just wanna pray for you. I wanna pray, Holy Spirit come. I ask you to give courage to cry out, to confess, to say to the Lord, maybe to a trusted friend, this is what I've done. God, this is the situation. God, I need you to come and carry my shame. Take it off me. Place it on the cross. Come Holy Spirit. The God of compassion would love to set you free from your shame. What about if you're somebody who is a parent maybe, or a friend, you notice somebody else and you see that they're carrying shame. They're an internalizer, they come out angry, they seem to be retreating. At this time, 
with all the threat of all the stuff going on with COVID, this internalizing seems to be happening a lot. And the question people are asking in this moment is, who do I think I am? They feel a sense of blame. So when people make a mistake, if we want to be agents of hope, our question isn't a question of who is to blame in this moment. Parents, trying to help your kids not to try and work out who is to blame. But instead, rather than asking who do you think you are, we focus on do you know who God is? We point to God. An agent of hope points to the God to whom people can cry out. Ports the God who's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. The God who is faithful and just and he'll forgive all who come to him, who cry out and repent. He's the God who wants to give grace and mercy and kindness to even the biggest mistakes that have been made. So we want to just encourage you, let's be people who go out seeking to be agents of hope, to spot those who are internalizing and to just give them a, a help, a helping hand to begin to cry out, do they know who God is, who wants to help them? So I want to finish by telling you the story of a man called Richard Wormbrandt, who was a Romanian pastor living quite a long time ago, just at the end of the Second World War. He, he was a preacher in the underground church that was persecuted and tortured by the communist regime, whose agenda was to wipe out all forms of religion in Romania. Now, Richard Wormbrand had spent many years in prison. He'd also, he was a man of Jewish descent and he'd married a woman of Jewish descent, Sabina. And they both not only had been tortured and persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ, but also that Sabina's family had been taken away uh, in, during the war uh, with the agreement of many R Romanians who collaborated with the Nazis. And they'd been taken away and they'd been killed in some of the pogroms. And ultimately, uh, she had lost many family members. Now we come to a moment in the story where Richard Wormbrand is in his flat with his wife. His wife's asleep and he's heard that one of the men who was one of the chief Nazi sympathizers who'd actually overseen the killing of many of the Jewish Romanians is present in the in the town and actually he discovers that he's upstairs. So he goes and sees him and invites him down into his flat. Um, as, as we get into the situation, uh, the man called Barilla has been boasting that he's slaughtered thousands of Jews and he's telling stories about how he's just killed thousands. And we hit the story here. Barilla, um, Wormbrand says this, I stopped and turned to Barilla. I have something very important to say to you, I told him. Please speak, he said. He said, if you look through that curtain into the bedroom, you'll see someone is asleep in the next room. It's my wife, Sabina. Her parents, her sisters and her 12 year old brother have been killed with the rest of the family. You told me that you'd killed hundreds of Jews near Golta and that is where they were taken. Looking into his eyes, I added, you yourself don't know who you have shot. So we have to assume that you are the murderer of her family. He jumped up, his eyes blazing and looking as if he was about to strangle me. I held up my hand and said, now let's try an experiment. I shall wake my wife and tell her who you are and what you've done. I can tell you what will happen. My wife did not speak. My wife will not speak one word of reproach. She'll embrace you as if you were her brother. She'll bring you supper, the best things she has in the house. Now, if Sabina, who is a sinner like us all, can forgive and love like this, imagine how Jesus, who is perfect love, can forgive and love you. Only return to him and everything you've done will be forgiven. Barilla was not heartless. Within, he was consumed by guilt and misery at what he had done. And he had shaken his brutal talk. He could shaken his brutal talk at us as a crab its claws. One tap at his weak spot and his defences crumbled. The music he'd already been playing moved his heart. Instead of an attack he expected, words of forgiveness. His reaction was amazing. He jumped up and tore at his collar with both hands, so his shirt was rent apart. Oh God, what shall I do? 
What shall I do, he cried. He put his head in his hands and sobbed noisily as he rocked himself back and forth. I'm a murderer. I'm soaked in blood. What shall I do? Tears ran down his cheeks. I cried, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the devil of hatred to go out of your soul. Barilla fell on his knees, trembling, and we be began to pray aloud. Church, people, wouldn't it be amazing to be somebody who could see shame broken off someone else to such an extent as that, that somebody who is an angry, boastful murderer can be changed just through love and compassion into somebody who gives himself to seeking to restore, to seeking to love, to seeking to care. Wouldn't it be amazing to be agents of hope who bring hope to those who carry shame? And so just to really bring this home, maybe for you, you don't carry shame. I want to pray that you, God, Give us eyes to see those who carry shame around us. Would you empower us to be people who set them free in Jesus? And if you do carry shame, we've prayed for you already, but I just encourage you, cry out to the Lord. We've got pods, great places where there's trusted leaders. You may not even want to say something to the whole of the group, but you can just mention to the leader, look, can I have a chat? I need to tell you something. You can contact me, contact Leslie, just say, look, I just need to tell you something. I just need to tell somebody. And if you want to do that, we would love to hear it. Our heart is to be like our God, to be a God of compassion, who's willing to set people free. So Holy Spirit, use this talk, I pray, in the life of all those who've seen it.